Welcome. This video is about the formal proof system for first order logic. I will first define what formal proofs are. Our proof system is called a Hilbert style deductive system, and there are many variants of such systems. The differences are not so important, but what is important is that we are able to prove a completeness theorem for our proof system. In this proof, we use an idea that goes back to Henkin. Our formal proof system has the property that every first order sentence that has a formal proof is valid. It's true in all structures. This is called soundness and it's quite easy to see. Our formal proof system also has the property that every statement that is valid, every first order sentence that holds in all structures has a formal proof. This is called completeness. We will work in a slightly more general setting where we have some fixed first order theory T and where we would like to know whether T implies some first order sentence phi. For example, if T is the theory ZFC and phi is the well ordering theorem, then the answer would be yes. Or as another example, we might want to know whether ZF implies the axiom of choice, just as an example. We can replace the axiom of choice by any mathematical statement that you are interested in. A formal proof in T is simply a finite sequence of sentences. Each sentence in this sequence is either a logical axiom, these are first order sentences that hold in all structures, or a sentence from T. Or it can be derived from two sentences that come earlier in the sequence by a simple proof rule, which is called modus ponens. We already know modus ponens from propositional logic. It states that if phi is a tautology and phi implies psi is a tautology, then psi is a tautology. There's the following variant of modus ponens for first order logic. If t implies for all x phi and t implies for all x phi implies psi, then t implies for all x psi. So if phi 0 and phi 1 are sentences in my proof that look as in the assumptions of modus ponens, then phi 2 may look as a sentence in the conclusion of modus ponens. We write t vertical line dash phi and say that phi has a proof in t if there exists a formal proof in t that ends with phi. All that remains for introducing my formal proof system is to specify what the logical axioms are that we can use in our formal proofs. I start with axioms about fundamental properties of the equality relation. The first axiom is for all x, x equals x. This is called E1 and it expresses that equality is reflexive. The second axiom is for all x and y, x equals y implies y equals x. This is called E2 and expresses that equality is symmetric. The third axiom is for all x, y and z, if x equals y and y equals z, then x equals z. This is called E3 and expresses that equality is transitive. Then I need for every function symbol f of every t n in the signature, the axiom for all x1 up to xn and y1 up to yn, if x i equals y i for all i, then f applied to x1 up to xn equals f applied to y1 up to yn. This is called E4 and it states that equal things behave equally under function application. We have a similar axiom E5 for equality with respect to relation symbols instead of function symbols. So we see that the set of axioms and therefore also our proof system depends on the signature. It should be clear that all of these sentences hold in all tau structures. The next axiom is actually not one axiom, but infinitely many. For every first order tau formula phi with three variables y and for every variable x, we have the axiom for all y phi implies for all y and for all x phi. This is called Q1. The Q indicates that it is an axiom about quantifiers. Clearly, this sentence holds for all tau structures. On the right, we just added a dummy variable, which has no effect on the truth value of the sentence. I will present two concrete instances of Q1. 
for the signature that just contains a single unary relation symbol R. The first is for all Z, R of Z implies for all Z and X, R of Z. So here we instantiate phi with the formula R of Z. The second example is for all Z, R of Z implies for all X, for all Z, R of Z. Note that here the order of the variables X and Z is flipped. The reason is that here we instantiated phi with the sentence for all Z, R of Z. And the universally quantified string of variables y and q1 is empty. Also, q2 consists of infinitely many axioms. We have for every tau formula phi with three variables y and three variable x, the axiom that says for all y, if for all x, not phi, then there is no x such that phi. It is clear that also Q2 holds in all tau structures. Infinitely many axioms. You might say, stop, this is cheating. If you allow infinitely many axioms, you could simply allow all valid sentences as axioms. And that would give you a sound and complete proof system. So that's cheating. And that brings me to a very important feature of our proof system. Our proofs can be checked by a computer, even in polynomial time. So all the axioms that we have seen so far, it is so easy to check from a given first order sentence whether it is one of those axioms. And it's also easy to check whether modus ponens is applied correctly. The axioms that we have introduced so far can be checked by a computer. For Q1, we simply have to decide whether there exists a formula phi such that the sentence is of the given form. It's easy to write a computer program to do that. There's no brain required for doing that. To specify the next axiom, we need the concept of substitution. Let S and T be tau terms and let X be a variable. We write S square brackets X maps to T for the term obtained from S by replacing all three occurrences of X by T. So for example, if we have F of X, Y square brackets X maps to G of G of Y, then we'll obtain the term F of G of G of Y comma Y. For this notation, there are many, many variations in the literature. Almost every author has her own convention. So I picked the notation that I found most intuitive and has less clashes with other notation in, in the course notes. Axiom scheme Q3 has for every tau formula phi with uh, three variables y and x and t a tau term with variables y, the sentence for all y phi replace x by t implies there exists an x phi. Again, it is clear that this sentence holds in all tau structures, simply because the term evaluated for some values in the structure provides a witness for the existentially quantified variable x. The next axioms are formed for all tau formulas phi and psi with free variables y and the variable x that is not free in phi. We then have the axiom for all y, for all x, phi implies psi, implies phi implies for all x, psi. This is axiom q4 and q5 is just the converse. If you have a close look at these uh, sentences, then you see that they hold in all tau structures again. Finally, we have the axiom scheme taught for tautology. For every propositional tautology phi with propositional variables x1 up to xm and for all first order tau formulas psi1 up to psi m with free variables x, we have the axiom for all x 
phi of psi 1 up to psi m, where phi of psi 1 up to psi m denotes the formula obtained from phi by replacing each propositional variable xi by psi i. Again, it is clear that since phi is a propositional tautology, the resulting sentence is valid. Recall that we have seen several algorithms in an earlier video about the satisfiability problem for testing whether a given propositional formula is a tautology. It follows that the axioms from taught can also be checked by a computer. Instead of taught, we could have used a smaller set of propositional axioms that go back to Gensen, with the advantage that then we can even check in polynomial time whether a given sentence is an axiom or not. But to keep things simple, we will work with taught in this course. I will give an example of a formal proof. Let phi be a tau formula with three variables y and x, and let t be a tau term with variables y. Then, over the empty theory, there is a formal proof of the sentence for all y, for all x phi implies phi, where we replace x by the term t. Semantically, it's quite clear that this is a valid sentence because if a statement holds for all x, it holds in particular for the value returned by t. But we want a formal proof of this statement. I warn you, these formal proofs are not easy to read. I will use the axiom Q3 for the formula not phi and the term t, which is for all y, not phi, where we replace x by t, implies exists x not phi. Our next sentence in the formal proof is a bit long, so that I don't read it out loud, but I just write it and explain it after writing. I claim that this sentence is an instance of taught because it states the principle of contraposition. If not x implies y, then not y implies x. Our next sentence in the formal proof is the sentence that we want to prove eventually, namely for all y, for all x phi implies phi x replaced by t. And we obtain it by modus ponens from the previous two sentences. The completeness theorem takes the following short and elegant form. Phi has a formal proof in t if and only if t implies phi. The forward direction in this theorem is easy to prove by induction over the length of the formal proof. For the converse, suppose that phi does not have a formal proof in t. We have to show that t union, the negation of phi, has a model. So we have to construct a model. And the construction that we use is called hanking construction. The idea is to add new constant symbols. By new, I mean that these constant symbols are not in the signature of t and phi, in the signature that we started with. A Hankin theory is a tau union rho theory, such that for every tau union rho formula phi with three variable x, there exists a constant in rho, such that the theory t contains the sentence if there exists an x such that phi of x, then phi of c. The constants from rho will then be called the Hankin constants of t. Where do Hankin theories come from? Well, if a is a tau union rho structure, such that every element of a is denoted by some constant from rho, then the theory of a is a Hankin theory. This is because if exists x phi of x is true in a, there must be some element of A that satisfies phi. And there must also be a constant C in rho that denotes this element. And hence we have phi of C. 
So the theory of A contains all the sentences that we need for Hankin theories. Our first lemma will state that under a certain extra condition, there is a converse to this observation. For every Hankin theory T that meets this condition, there is a structure A such that T is the theory of A. A tau theory T is called finitely complete if first T is consistent. That is, there is no tau sentence phi such that there is a formal proof of phi in T and a formal proof of not phi in T. Of course, if you want to construct a model of T, this condition is certainly necessary. Second, for every tau sentence phi, either there is a formal proof of phi in T, or there is a formal proof of not phi in T. Now, our lemma says that every finitely complete Hankin theory has a model. The idea is that for such theories, we can directly construct the model A by reading it off from the theory. Formally, the elements of our structure A are equivalence classes of Hankin constants, where C1 and C2 are equivalent. If there is a proof, a formal proof in C of C1 equals C2. Note that this indeed gives an equivalence relation because of our axioms E1, E2 and E3. We write C in square brackets for the equivalence class of C with respect to our equivalence relation. To construct our structure A, we also have to say how the operations and relations of A look like. If f is a function symbol of arity k in the signature tau, then the operation of A for f is defined as follows. It maps square bracket c1 up to square bracket ck to square bracket c0 if there is a formal proof in T of the sentence f of c1 up to ck equals c0. It follows from the equality axiom E4 that this is well defined. One can also show that f is defined on all of a to the k using the axioms q1 and q3 and the assumption that t is a Hankin theory. This is a bit technical and left to the reader. The relations of a are defined similarly. And that's the entire construction. That's how a looks like. And we claim that a is indeed a model of t. Our proof is by induction on the size of sentences. If phi is of the form not psi, then A models phi if and only if A does not model psi. If and only if psi has no formal proof in T by inductive assumption. This in turn is the case if and only if not psi has a formal proof in T by finite completeness. And this is what we had to show. If phi is of the form psi1 and psi2, then A models psi1 and psi2 if and only if A models psi1 and A models psi2. By inductive assumption, this is equivalent to psi1 having a formal proof in T and psi2 having a formal proof in T. And finally, one can show that this is the case if and only if psi1 and psi2 has a formal proof in T. I leave this as an exercise. If phi is of the form exists x psi, then a models phi if and only if a models psi of c for some Hankin constant c by the construction of a. This is the case if and only if phi of c has a formal proof in t by inductive assumption. And this in turn is the case if and only if phi has a formal proof in t. Here we use here we have to use the axiom Q three and and some some reasoning with formal proofs that I also leave to the reader. And this is the end of the proof. Interestingly, so far we have only used the, the axioms for equality Q three Q one, also taught implicitly and of course modus ponens, but not Q 
Q2 and Q4 and Q5. They will be used later. So all that is left for the proof of the completeness theorem is showing that if phi does not have a formal proof in T, then T union not phi can be extended to a finitely complete Hankin theory T star, because such a theory has a model. And hence the reduct of this model to the original signature is a model of T union not phi. First of all, if phi does not have a formal proof in T, then T union not phi is consistent. This requires proof, but you can find the full proof in the course notes. We now need new constant symbols for the Hanking constants to define T star. They are defined uh, as the union of an increasing sequence rho zero, rho one, and so on of constant symbols, starting with the empty set for rho zero. Now for every tau union rho i formula, phi, with one free variable x, we introduce a new constant symbol c phi and define rho i plus one to be the extension of rho i by all those constant symbols. Rho is then defined as the union of all the rho i. And it is rho that will be the set of Hanking constants for our theory T star. We define a sequence of theories T i as follows. T zero is T union not phi. T i plus one is the union of T i and the set of all sentences of the form there exists an x theta of x implies theta of C of theta for all tau union rho i formulas theta. Our first claim is that ti is consistent for every i. And this can be shown by induction on i. It looks quite plausible, but to prove it in full detail takes some care. It is here where we use q2, q4 and q5. The next claim is that the union of all the ti is consistent. This is actually quite easy to see. Since every formal proof in a theory, by definition, only uses finitely many sentences from that theory. So all of these sentences must come from ti for some sufficiently large i. And there we already know the statement. We can now apply Zorn's lemma and obtain a maximal, with respect to inclusion, consistent tau union rho theory t star which contains all the ti. And here we claim t star is finitely complete. And this follows from maximality. If a tau union rho sentence has no formal proof in t star, then t star together with the negation of that sentence is consistent. So maximality of t star implies that the negation of that sentence is in t star, showing finite completeness. And this finishes the the entire proof of the completeness theorem. The completeness theorem has several interesting applications. One of them is the compactness theorem, which states that if you have a theory which is unsatisfiable, which does not have a model, it has a finite subset which is already unsatisfiable. And this is indeed an easy consequence of the completeness theorem, because if you have a formal proof that the theory is unsatisfiable, this proof must be finite by definition. So it can use only finitely many sentences in this theory. So if you put all those sentences together, you can use the same proof to show that it's unsatisfiable. And hence the finite, you found a finite subset which is unsatisfiable. And this proves the compactness theorem. So you see it's an easy consequence of the completeness theorem. But itself, the compactness theorem has many applications. And this will be the topic of the next video.